Good morning, Professor Collins. Good morning. Um, let me explain what's going to happen. Uh, in a moment or two, Mary will uh, ask you to affirm, uh, and uh, after that, Miss Scott will ask you some questions. Uh, the, the audience that you see uh, in front of you is, is small and select. Um, they represent uh, the public, the audience to your left, uh, are, are members of the legal profession, um, instructed by various of the core participants, as well as uh, those who are lawyers for the inquiry. But you're talking in particular to those beyond this room. Um, it'll be a, around 100 or so, um, maybe more, the people who will be watching online through YouTube or live stream. So that is uh, your audience. Everything you say will be transcribed and the transcript will be checked and then released onto the internet. And so it may be that people will pick up what you've had to say uh, in a, a wider forum. Um, Ms. Uh, Mary. Please state your full name. John Collins. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth <clears throat> Miss Scott <clears throat> Professor Collins I'm going to start by um, asking you some questions about your qualifications and your career um, uh, history so you qualified in medicine at the University in Bristol in 1984 is that right that's correct yes uh, and you then undertook postgraduate training in medicine and neurology before being appointed an honorary consultant in neurology at St Mary's Hospital in London in 1994. Correct. <clears throat> also in 1994, you were appointed a Wellcome Trust Senior Fellow in the Clinical Sci Sciences. Correct. Yeah. Uh, did that mean that the Wellcome Trust was funding you to carry out independent research? Yes, precisely. It, it's a fellowship which covered my salary plus the salary of um, a team of scientists and research funding. <clears throat> and what were you researching at that stage? I was researching uh, CJD and other prion diseases. Um, in the early stages, I was particularly focusing on genetic risk factors. <clears throat> uh, and you were also in 1994 appointed to a personal chair at Imperial College. What did that entail? Um, well, it's essentially a, it's a title um, uh, of professor uh, of uh, molecular genetics and um, uh, it, essentially an academic title, but uh, it didn't involve any change in my responsibilities. <clears throat> and then in 1996, you became a Wellcome Trust Principal Fellow in the Clinical Sciences at Imperial College School of Medicine. Uh, and you um, uh, also um, established a specialist NHS clinic for prion disease at St Mary's Hospital, London, which was later designated the NHS National Prion Clinic. Was that, can you recall the date that you um, established that uh, prion clinic? Um, well, I was seeing patients with prion disease, um, you know, throughout the 1990s, um, just in, in general neurology clinics. Um, as I was developing specialist interest in, in these diseases. But um, with the arrival of variant CJD and concerns that there may be large numbers of cases looming with that uh, disease, uh, we set up a specialist clinic at St Mary's Hospital. That, that will have been around you know, late 96, 97. I can't remember precisely. <clears throat> and... Uh it was later designated the NHS National Prion Clinic. What, what does that designation mean? Well, it was designated a national service by the Department of Health uh, 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 and indeed by the, by the NHS Trust uh, together uh, gave it that designation to have a national role of seeing patients from all over the UK. Um, in 1998, you founded and established the Medical Research Council Prion Unit at the Imperial College School of Medicine, also at St Mary's Hospital. 
Um, and was this a unit uh, set up to conduct research specifically into prion disease? Yes, it was set up at the request of government. The Medical Research Council were asked by government um, to establish the MRC has a, uh, around 20 or 30 units that, that are um, focusing on particular challenging scientific issues uh, in the medical field. And um, I was asked to, to put together a unit to work specifically on prion disease uh, to try and understand the basic biology of these diseases and ultimately to develop better tests and uh, treatments for it. <clears throat> and in 2001, both the prion clinic and the prion unit moved from St. Mary's Hospital to the UCL Institute of Neurology and National Hospital for Neurology at Queen's Square part of the UCLH NHS Foundation Trust, is that right? That's right, yes. Um, and at the same time, you were appointed to an established chair in neurology at UCL uh, and founded and headed the University Department of Neurodegenerative Diseases. Correct, yes. Um, and then in 2017, the MRC Research Unit became part of UCL and is now called the MRC Prion Unit at UCL. Correct. Um, and you left the Institute of Neurology to establish a new UCL Institute of Prion Disease within which the MRC Prion Unit at UCL now sits. Correct. Um, so is it right to understand in terms of your current appointments that you are Professor of Neurology at the University of College London, mm -hmm. that you are you also have a, a role as a clinician as an honorary consultant neurologist and director of the NHS National Prion Clinic. Correct. And you also have a role heading up um, the research, the MRC Prion Unit and Institute of, Institute of Prion Diseases at UCL, which is a, a, research, a research role. Correct. I mean, we integrate the two together. The, the research unit and the clinic work very closely together. <clears throat> so just looking then at, at your clinical work um, as uh, honorary consultant neurologist and director of the NHS National Prion Clinic. <clears throat> Can you just tell us, broadly speaking, what the National Prion Clinic does and what it offers to patients and how patients come to be referred, to be referred there? Um, so we have a national role. Um, and. Um, Indeed, all neurologists in the UK are asked to refer patients to us and also to the National CJD Surveillance Unit in Edinburgh. Uh, that was a, a national referral agreement established by the then Chief Medical Officer, Sir Liam Donaldson, I think back in about 2004. Um, obviously, most of the patients we see with CJD um, have a rapidly progressive neurological illness and many would be unable to travel to the clinic in London or it would be inappropriate for them to travel to the clinic in London. So we have three mobile teams um, of uh, doctors and nurses that uh, go out to see patients when they're referred from neurologists around the UK. And we normally see them either in the hospital they're at or, or in some cases they're at home. Um, we also, uh, of course, see patients at, at a clinic um, as part of University College Hospital, part of the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. So we see we have run outpatient clinics also for patients that are able to attend. Um, around 15% of patients with prion disease actually have an inherited disorder uh, rather than sporadic CJD. And that's associated with a much longer clinical duration usually. Uh, and we are also in the, in the course of such, uh, looking after such families, identify people who are at risk of carrying the mutations, who will develop the mutations at some stage, uh, develop disease at some stage during their life. And so uh, we see a lot of those individuals in outpatients in terms of long-term follow-up uh, and care for them. And just to get an idea of, of what the team actually looks like, it, it, it's a multidisciplinary team, is it? It is, yes. We have, uh, th there, are, there are three consultant, actually now four consultant neurologists, including myself. Uh, then we have junior doctors, uh, clinical fellows, uh, who do most of the you know, going out around the country work. Um, and we have um, three clinical nurse specialists. 
Uh, we have a senior nurse manager who oversees the operation and an administrator and a medical secretary. Uh, we also have part-time a clinical psychologist uh, who can perform um, clinical, clinical um, psychology assessments of patients and also provide counselling. Um, and we have other ancillary um, people associated with us. We're obviously closely integrated within the National Hospital itself where we can do neuroimaging and all the other investigations that are required. And you mentioned um, the National <coughs> um, CJD Research and Surveillance Unit. Um, you ha do you have links with that organisation? Yes, very much so. So we, obviously, they're, they're fulfilling a very important role in providing statistical information for government on the number of, uh, number of cases with the different forms of the disease. So it's important they're aware of every case. And uh, so we have uh, formal monthly meetings where one of the consultants meets with the director of the uh, surveillance unit and compare you know, all the patients that we're aware of um, and ensures there's, there's seamless communication on those. Uh, but in practice, my team is, is, is on the phone to their opposite numbers of the surveillance unit multiple times a week. So you know, we work very closely together. And are there other organisations that you have formal links with around the country? Uh, well, the patient support groups, the CJD support network, as the Cure CJD Foundation, which fundraises for research on therapeutics, um, and as well as international patient support groups we're, we're closely allied with. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then um, turning then to the MRC Prion unit, um, you told us that it was set up to carry out research into treatments and um, tests and so on. Um, to get an idea again of the size of the team there, w w what is the size of the team there? Uh, the unit's about 100 people. Um, that's including you know, all the scientists, technicians and uh, professional support staff. <clears throat> and again, in terms of links with other organisations, presumably with the research and surveillance unit in, up in Edinburgh, are there mm. any other organisations that the um, unit has links with? Well, we have many collaborations nationally and internationally. I mean, we still work very closely with colleagues at the Institute of Neurology and the national, other parts of the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, so that we have a large number of links and collaborations uh, across UCL. Um, we also have lots of international collaborations in, in the science around the world as needed to develop certain aspects of the science. Turning then back, back to your CV, as it were, um, is it right that you're also a, a member of the UCL Academic Board and the UCL Faculty of Brain Sciences and the UCL Institute of Neurology Executive Committees? Right, yes. Um, <coughs> you, your, <coughs> excuse me, your witness statement also um, sets out a number of other roles that you, um, you have. So it, it tells us that you're a, di a director and shareholder of a, a company called DGen Limited. Is that right? That's right, yes. And can you tell us uh, broadly what, what that is, what that company does? Um, it's an academic spin-out company. You know, universities will often form companies to... Uh, to facilitate commercialization of research coming out of the, out of the uh, university. It was established actually by Imperial College when I was still at Imperial. Um, and what it basically does is it, 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 it doesn't have employees. It's, um, it's rather a small enterprise that manages the intellectual property portfolio. So my successive employers, Imperial, MRC, UCL, uh, pipelined intellectual property that was developed my research into DGEN, which has maintained that intellectual property portfolio uh, with a view to licensing it to produce products of use to deal with these problems. So, for example, uh, DGEN licensed a BSE test to, to Roche, I seem to think, uh, licensed work we'd done to develop a surgical instrument decontaminant to DuPont. Uh, and so on. So it's facilitating those sort of interactions, but its main role has been to is to maintain an intellectual property portfolio over a long period of time. Uh, universities tend to file patents, and then if they can't find a, a buyer for them, you know, often let them lapse because they can become quite expensive. But uh, clearly, with the sort of work we are doing, it needs a long-term approach to to develop an intellectual property portfolio, without which it becomes impossible to to get commercial partners to take on 
things that, you know, so that they can leave the laboratory and actually be a benefit to patients. And we'll come on later on today to look at some of the um, uh, uh, um, matters that DGEN are, are involved with, in particular your, your um, blood test. Um, now, you've set out in your statement a, a great number of working groups and committees and steering groups and so on that you've sat on an, um, uh, over the years, and I'm not mm. going to go through those. Um, they're there for uh, people to read. Um, I am just going to pick up on a, a couple of the uh, ones that we're particularly interested in. So um, you were a member of the Spongiform Enca Enca Encephalopathy Advisory Committee, or SEAC, mm -hmm. Uh, from 1996 to 2002, and then again from 2007 to, to 2010. Is that is that right? That's correct. Yes. I'm just going to um, have a look then at the terms of reference of that. Um, if we could have, please, uh, Lawrence, um, MHRA 0020531. So this <clears throat> doesn't have a header on it, but we can see uh, three quarters of the way down there, chapter three, the work of the committee during the year um, issues considered by SEAC, 1st of April 97 to 30th of March 98. So I understand that this is the first SEAC annual report from 1997 to 1998. And if we turn, please, to page four... We can see that it's uh, under introduction. It says that SIAC is an advisory, non-departmental public body appointed by ministers and sponsored jointly by the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food and the Department of Health to provide independent scientific advice to government. And it has the following terms of reference. To provide scientifically based advice to the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, the Department of Health and Territorial Departments on matters relating to spongiform encephalopathies, taking account of the remits of other bodies with related responsibilities. So is that what you understood the terms of reference to be, certainly in the first period of your uh, time on SEAC? Yes, that's correct. Um, we'll look tomorrow at uh, changes to those terms of reference with um, Professor Einstein, but those took place in 2004. Tomorrow? I'm oh, sorry. beg your pardon. Tuesday. Thank you, not Saturday. Tuesday uh, with Professor Ironside. Um, um, now, we can see as well, if we turn over to page 24, please... That you were uh, that, the, that you were a member of the sub um, of the SIAC um, epidemiology subgroup on VCJD. So it's right to understand, is it, that there was the, the, the there was SIAC itself, the main committee, and then there were subgroups that uh, and you sat on. Correct. This. Yeah. Um, and then just to understand how SIAC uh, provided evidence, uh, provided um, uh, advice to government. If we could look, please, at page 27. We can see there there's, it's headed Annex 4, Complete Texts of SEAC Statements and Summaries 97 to 98. And then if we go to the one that's relevant to this inquiry at page 37, please. No, not 37, 34. We can see um, SEAC advice to ministers, human blood and blood products. The committee have recently concluded that tr the transmissible agent of NVCJD NV is indistinguishable from that of BSE, but distinctly different from any of the forms of classical C CJD. Recent research, some unpublished, suggests that the patho pathogenesis of NVCJD differs from that of classical CJD and the former may have more involvement of lymphoreticular tissues, possibly involving circulating lymphocytes. Therefore, it's logical to seek to minimise any risk from blood or blood products by reducing the number of lymphocytes present. So here we can see, and I'm going to come back to the advice itself, but just in terms of the process, here we can see in this first paragraph that the committee is giving, um, reviewing scientific evidence and advising the, com the, the, the government on the position 
according to that scientific evidence? Is that part of the role that the committee um, uh, fulfilled? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, and then we can see um, it, the committee then goes on to then um, uh, make some uh, concrete uh, recommendations to government. And in the second paragraph, we can see what that recommendation is, that they should consider a precautionary policy of extending the use of leukodepleted blood and blood products as far as is practicable. But it will be for the NBA, the National Blood Authority, to devise a strategy to implement such a policy um, and then says it will take time. Uh, for that to um, uh, be worked through. Um, and then right at the bottom of that paragraph, it says in the last sentence, SIAC recommends that risk assessments making assumptions of various possible incidences of NVC NVCJD be carried out to inform decisions on any measures which may be necessary to protect recipients. Again, just looking at the process, um, is it right to understand then that, that um, uh, concrete recommendations are made for particular pieces of work that the departments may need to commission. Um, and that, again, forms part of the role of SEAC. Yes, I mean, the two sponsoring departments would put questions to SEAC on which they wanted scientific advice. <clears throat> uh, now, ju uh, just sticking again with, with the process, and, um, it, did SEAC issuing written advice to ministers here um, were there meetings with government ministers or the chief medical officer or the like um, between, with, uh, um, with, with SIAC? Um, I can't remember the exact sequence of events, uh, but I do recall there were discussions on SIAC about, uh, obviously about the risks associated with blood in the light of findings about the pathogenesis of variant CJD. Um, uh, and, you know, truly there, there was an advisory statement there. I, I was, as I say in my statement, I was asked to go and meet the Secretary of State at the time directly. It was then Frank Dobson. Um, uh, John Patterson also attended that meeting, so John Patterson, who was chair of SEAC. Um, I guess because a lot of the work that had underpinned the concerns about variant CJD, in particular the widespread involvement of the lymph reticular system had come from my laboratory and uh, the Secretary of State wanted to ask me about that evidence and, and what my opinions were as to, to what to do. Uh, it was a meeting attended by a number of his senior civil servants and the Chief Medical Officer, as I recall, uh, in addition to John Patterson and myself. And come on to ask you about the detail of that. So just again sticking with the process, is it right to understand then that no formal um, uh, program of meetings necessarily between SEAC and department minister, ministers and the CMO and so on, but as and when required, if, if um, they required more um, information, uh, advice from SEAC or members of SEAC, then th that would be arranged. Is that a fair way to... Um, well, in my experience, being called directly into the Secretary of State was, was unusual. Uh, that, that wouldn't normally happen. Um, uh, ministers didn't attend SEAC meetings and um, very occasionally the chief medical officer I think attended a, a, a SEAC meeting but that was, I can only remember that happening on one occasion of which I was a member. Um, there were uh, more junior government officials present throughout as, as observers and secretariat uh, for the meetings and they uh, I presume took minutes and reported back as they saw fit to, uh, to ministers. Um, mo moving on to some of the other committees then that you uh, worked on um, uh, and set out in your, in your witness statement, you were a member of the Committee on the Safety of Medicines Working Group on TSE and VCJD, is that right? Um, I'm not sure I can remember that, but <laughs> if that's in my statement I will have looked it up, but I, I can't, there were, there were many Yes. Groups and subgroups around that time, uh, a dazzling number of them, actually. Um, and for a short period of time, you remember the CJD incidents panel. Is that, is that right? I think so. Again, I, I can't really recollect that. Uh, but um, I think I was probably involved in the very early stages uh, when that was getting established. And so picking... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. 
picking up on, on, on what you've just said, that there are a dazzling number of, of groups. Um, how, how well did they work, given, given how many, how well did they work together, given there were so, so many? It, it could lead, potentially, the, the, the downsides potentially of having so many groups are that there's either a degree of overlap, and so the same groups and committees are discussing and making decisions about the same thing, or there's a fragmentation of decisions and there's no overall um, decision making. Have you got any insights or views about how the, all those different groups work together over the, the over this period? Yes, there are a lot of groups, and not just SIAC related groups, but but parts parts of government that were involved and different government committees that were involved. And um, actually, I think there was a question about coordination, as you as you imply. And I remember asking on SIAC, uh, we formally asked on SIAC for what I think eventually became known as the SIAC wiring diagram, um, a sort of sheet of A4 with all the different committees and how they interacted with one another. Uh, it might be worth having a look at that. I think it's quite um, revealing uh, about the large numbers of different entities that were, were involved. <clears throat> and having obtained that diagram, were you satisfied that, there, that, that, that the system worked, that it, it all worked together sufficiently well? Um, things can always be improved. Um, this was joining SIAC at, right at the beginning of uh, 1996, I think January 96 was my first meeting. Um, it was the first time I'd ever sat on a government advisory committee, so I, you know, I was a new boy with all this, and, um, you know, but um, I, I suspect, as is often the case in government, um, you know, things can often be joined up a little bit better than they sometimes are. And then just continuing with your um, uh, work on, on uh, groups and so on, you, you tell us in your statement that you're a, you're a member of the CJD International Support Alliance and the Friends and Advisors Group. Can you just tell us a little bit about what those organisations are and what your role is on them? Yes, there are a number of you know, patient and family-led groups around the world um, which play a very important role in counselling and supporting patients and families and in some cases fundraising for research and um, uh, there, there are two such groups in the UK um, many countries have these there's a, there's a very large one in the United States um, and this has been brought to, together under the umbrella of, a, of an international alliance which, which meets from time to time uh, and they have a group of professional advisors of which I'm one uh, that they speak to from time to time and um, uh, we're invited from time to time to speak at their meetings to, to patients and families, and in particular to give updates on research. And um, for those uh, listening, um, you, you've also given uh, written and oral evidence to the House of Commons Select Committee on uh, VCJD uh, in 2013. Uh, which led to their report after the storm, it published in July 2014, is that right? That's correct, yeah. And, and for the transcript, the um, uh, document references are um, for, for those um, uh, evidences in the report, NCRU 40320 <clears throat> underscore 005, TSTC 5051 and TSTC 5052. Um, it, I'm going to come on and ask you um, to um, tell us about your role in various different decisions and, and, and pieces of research that you've done. Um, but in order to set that uh, evidence in context, I'm going to ask you some quite um, base, basic questions about, about what, VC, what VCJD is so that um, we can understand the evidence that you're um, are going to give us. Um, we've got... Um, Professor Ironside coming on Tuesday, and I'll pick up some of these issues with him in more detail, but just um, to give us a sort of starting outline. Um, <clears throat> can you tell us, please, what, uh, what um, a prion disease is? We understand VCJD is a prion disease, but what is a prion disease? Well, prion diseases are a group of degenerative brain diseases. Um, they're always progressive and invariably fatal. Uh, degenerative brain diseases. 
and they're caused by uh, prions, which are um, assemblies of misfolded proteins. We have a protein in our, bra uh, in our brains, it's a normal brain constituent called the prion protein, uh, which sits on the surface of brain cells. Um, but this protein uh, has the property of being able to, um, when it is misfolded, proteins have a particular way they're folded up into a three-dimensional shape, which is essential for their function. Uh, but they can also misfold, uh, and the prime protein can misfold in a, in a way that uh, many individual prime protein molecules stick together, forming long chains uh, or assemblies of protein. Uh, these form uh, fibers of the protein, which are technically referred to as, as amyloid. Um, and these, uh, as these fibers grow by recruiting more of the normal protein into these disease-associated forms, they also fragment. As they fragment, they've effectively produced more, you can think of them as seeds in the brain, uh, more seeds which then in turn grow, they fragment and form more seeds. So it's a, it's a self-propagating process um, akin to, for example, replication of a virus in the brain, but this is not a virus. Um, all other infectious agents that we're aware of have genomes, they have their own DNA or RNA genomes, but prions are, consist purely of protein. Uh, they don't have their own um, DNA or RNA. Um, and so this underpins a lot of their unique properties uh, and also some of the challenges of, of dealing with them. Uh, so these protein assemblies or aggregates of, of misfolded protein uh, constitute the prions and they propagate and spread throughout the brain. And the challenges that you mention are the difficulty in detecting the um, diseased um, prion proteins because they have, they're no different, are they, from, from a, a healthy prion protein? That's right. Chemically, they're identical. It's just a different shape uh, and that a number of them are stuck together rather than the prion protein itself sits on its own um, and has a, has a characteristic shape. Uh, but these are clumps, if you like, of misfolded protein but chemically they're identical to the normal protein. And so that, that's one of the challenges of distinguishing them. And of course, because it's one of our own proteins, uh, the, our immune system doesn't recognize it as foreign uh, in the same way. So you don't produce a normal defensive uh, immune response to these infections, which is also one of the reasons why they're so lethal. <clears throat> and you've touched on this already, but just to... Um, understand um, that there are, is this right, three different classes or forms of, of, of CJD. There's sporadic or classical, acquired and familial or inherited. Yes, so the, the, the prions that I've mentioned can arise essentially in one of three ways. Um, the commonest human prion disease is sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, sporadic CJD. Uh, this occurs at random in the population appears to arise essentially as an unlucky event in your brain, you can spontaneously develop prions, just as an unlucky event you could develop a cancer, for example. Uh, and th this is happening at random in the population. Um, uh, your lifetime risk of developing sporadic CJD is about one in 5,000, and it's randomly distributed, as I say, uh, in the population. That's the commonest form. Um, there are then inherited forms of the disease, uh, some of which will be described as CJD. Most of them actually don't, we wouldn't clinically call CJD because it produces quite a different pattern of disease. Uh, there are more than 40 different genetic mutations in the prion protein gene, which you can inherit from one of your parents, which result in you spontaneously producing prions some stage during your adult life. And then the disease progresses in the way I've described. But instead of the, you know, the, the chances of prions forming spontaneously in your brain if you have a normal prion protein gene is very low. But if you have one of these mutations, the chances of this happening are, for many of the mutations, certain. At some stage in your life, you will start producing prions. And that constitutes about 15% of the patients we see in the UK. And as I say, there are many different forms of what we call inherited prion diseases. Then there are forms that are acquired uh, and this is where the prions haven't formed spontaneously in your brain or you, you, you don't have a faulty gene, but rather you've been exposed to some source of prions in the environment. 
and um, the earliest recognition of this was transmission of prions as a result of medical accidents. So, for example, contaminated neurosurgical instruments or certain tissue grafts. Uh, most, the, the most numerous form relates to use of human pituitary-derived hormones, which were used to treat growth deficiency syndromes, but which some batches of which were contaminated with CJD prions, because this, these were, hormones were extracted from human tissues that were pulled together. That's so-called iatrogenic CJD. Um, and then there's variant CJD, um, and that uh, is due to dietary exposure to bovine spongiform encephalopathy prions. Um, so uh, BSE prions, which affected cattle, an epidemic disease of cattle, uh, are capable of, of jumping the so-called species barrier and, and infecting humans. Thankfully, that wasn't a very efficient process. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, that, that occurred. So that's another acquired prion disease where someone's been exposed to some source of prions in the environment. Uh, the other, um, historically, the other acquired prion disease we know a lot about was a disease called, called Kuru, uh, which was only seen in a small area of the highlands of Papua New Guinea, uh, which was transmitted at mortuary feasts. It was the practice in those communities for the deceased to be consumed at mortuary feasts, and that led to an epidemic prion disease, which, which still remains our, our largest uh, source of evidence about epidemic prion disease in humans. Uh, and so um, VCJD, as you say, is an acquired form of CJD, um, and you've described that the, is this right, that the primary infection um, is via the oral route, and then a, a secondary infection VCJD case would be where somebody has been exposed to uh, tissue or blood from someone that's in, already infected with VCJD uh, and themselves go, go on to develop? Or to, to That's right, primary CJD. It, it's assumed dietary exposure to BSE prions. We don't know that for certain, but that's the assumption that it was due to dietary, to contamination of food with, with BSE prions. Um, but yes, then secondary cases have occurred uh, as a result of use of blood and blood products derived from individuals who are incubating variant CJD. Um, uh, uh, now, to try and understand very broadly, uh, again, uh, how uh, the primary infection uh, works, I I is this right, that infection spreads from the gut, through the oral route, from, from the gut, through the lymphoreticular system to the brain? Is that how the disease progresses? Well, we don't know precisely in humans. Needless to say, we can't do experiments on humans to determine the route of of infection in, in animal models, that's what happens. And th that um, the first source of infection, uh, it's more complicated than that because different combinations of prion strains and different animals behave differently. But where there is um, a lymphoreticular phase, I should say in the other forms of CJD, perhaps I should just step back a bit, there, there are different strains of prions. So you're familiar, everyone's familiar now with there being different strains of viruses, for example, uh, that have differences in their nucleic acid genomes. Um, prions also come in different strains, despite the fact that they don't have nucleic acid. And, and how a protein assembly can enco encode information to specify different disease types is an area of intense scientific interest, one of the main interests of my unit. Um, so these different strains produce different patterns of disease and they can behave differently. So there's the strains of prions that cause classical CJD um, uh, tend not to involve the lymphoticular system at all. They're, they're almost exclusively propagating in the brain and the spinal cord. But in variant CJD, the pattern of pathogenesis in, very much involves the lymphoticular system. And so lymphoticular tissues um, which includes the gut-associated lymphoid tissue like the tonsils and patches of lymphoid tissue in the gut are the first place we think would be infected. They certainly are in animal models. Uh, probably in humans that's where the infection is getting a hold in the body and beginning to propagate. And again, from extrapolating from animal models, we then expect the prawns to spread along the nerves which innervate the lymphoid tissue uh, and they spread um, retrogradely up the nerves until they reach the, the spinal cord, 
uh, and then up into the or the cranial nerves if if, if it's um, uh, an infection uh, uh, higher up in the in the, in the system, um, and eventually the, the prions will get into the brain itself and begin to cause the neurological disease. So variant CJD is different from classical CJD in that respect, but you see this uh, marked propagation of prions in the lymph reticular system. The whole lymph reticular system is involved, the spleen, lymph nodes around the body, tonsils, and gut-associated lymphoid tissue, uh, and can have levels of prion infectivity there, up to 10% of the levels we see in brain. Mm. And, and you wouldn't expect to see uh, any prions detectable in the lymphoreticular system for somebody who has either a, a, a spor sporadic or an inherited prion CJD. That's right. I, it, it's, of course, it depends on our limit of detection. And, and with very sensitive methods, you can see low levels of prions in sporadic CJD in some other tissues outside the brain, but overwhelmingly it's in the brain and spinal cord, uh, whereas in variant CJD there's a much wider tissue distribution that's readily detectable. And for somebody who has uh, been exposed or has, has uh, developed VC CJD from a secondary infection route via blood, blood products, so not coming in through the gut, um, it, 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 would you expect to see the disease spread in, in a similar way or, or a different way to, to somebody who's got it from the oral route? Well, that was an important question early on as to whether the, the lymphoreticular phase is to do with the route of exposure because it's coming in through the mouth. Uh, does it spread through the lymphoreticular system? Is that the reason it's different? Or is it to do with the prong strain effect? And, and we didn't know that to begin with. Uh, that was one reason why we were studying Kuru at the time, uh, which we knew was orally transmitted. Uh, and we didn't see lymphoreticular involvement in Kuru. Um, uh, and in variant CJD, we reported in the Lancet, I think it's one of the papers that, that you have, uh, a patient who developed um, variant CJD following blood transfusion. And they did, it, despite the fact they'd been infected, of course, by the intravenous route, uh, they had the same pathogenesis with, with involvement of the lymph reticular system. That was, that was an important finding uh, that told us that secondary CJD also had a lymph reticular phase uh, and that had implications, of course, as to how you could potentially detect infected individuals. <clears throat> When did you um, and your laboratory start to become aware of the presence of abnormal prions in the lymph lymphoreticular tissue in patients with VC VCJD? Well, we began looking at that, uh, I think, for memory, in the second half of 1996. Obviously, variant CJD was only really recognised at the beginning of 1996. Um, and we established a number of studies in particular looking at the strain type of the prions to see whether it was indeed similar to that of causing BSE in cattle. So we were doing those sort of studies. But it also occurred that we, we knew that in sheep um, that also have this lymphoreticular, prominent lymphoreticular phase uh, when infected with, with so-called scrapie prions. Scrapie is a relatively common prion disease of sheep. Um, and um, we knew from work veterinary colleagues had done that um, the prions could be detected in the tonsil in sheep. And because this is a very accessible tissue in humans that, that could be easily biopsied, uh, we wondered whether that might be um, a possible means we could diagnose uh, variant CJD. And so uh, we began to do some experiments to see if that was the case. Um, uh, and we gathered together uh, tissues uh, from which consent had been given by relatives at autopsy to do research on the tissues. Uh, James Ironside and Edinburgh kindly provided some tissues too. Uh, and indeed we found that the lymphoreticular tissues in variant CJD were, uh, you could easily detect the abnormal prion, forms of the prion protein in, the, in those tissues. And that led us to go on to develop tonsil biopsy as a means of diagnosing um, variant CJD. But of course it also had implications, the fact that there was this wide, much wider tissue distribution, particularly um, we thought involving white blood cells, also raised more concerns that variant CJD might be transmitted by blood transfusion. In a way, sporadic CJD 
didn't seem to be transmissible. <clears throat> that was indeed my next question. Um, what, 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 what was it that the, the, the um, uh, presence of prime infection in the lymphoreticular tissue that led you to conclude, to conclude that VCJD may be transmissible by blood? Yeah, so it's, it's part of the immune system like the white blood cells uh, in, in the blood. Uh, it's all part of the, of the same system essentially. So the fact that we could detect prions really quite readily uh, in tonsil and lymph nodes and spleen from patients who died of variant CJD uh, did raise concerns that we might see bloodborne transmission. Uh, and also the wider concerns of surgical instrument de de uh, contamination as well, uh, with, since prions stick rather avidly to surgical stainless steel. So it generally you know, raised concerns uh, about blood transmission, about surgical transmission. And of course, at that stage, we had no idea how many people in the population were infected. We, we knew that the majority of the UK population had potentially been exposed to BSE primes. And there was great uncertainty about what lay ahead in terms of an epidemic size. Uh, and when did you become convinced that VCJD was transmitted by blood? Or Indeed, are, are you convinced that that is, that is the case? Um, well, there were the concerns in, in, in we, I think we published our first finding on, on that in The Lancet at the beginning of 1997. Um, and, but at that stage, you know, there was no evidence it had actually transmitted. But of course, it was early days. These diseases are associated with extremely long incubation, silent incubation periods. Um, but colleagues in Edinburgh subsequently uh, in the early 2000s were reporting uh, a couple of patients where there did seem to be a link with blood transfusion. People had developed variant CJD or have been found to have variant CJD infection at autopsy uh, that had received transfusion from donors had gone on to develop variant CJD. So you know, the probability of that happening with, with two individuals was pretty small. Uh, we reported a third case in the Lancet. I think, you, I think you have that paper. I've already alluded to that in terms of what we learned about the pathogenesis from studying autopsy patients, or autopsy tissues from that patient. Um, so I think with three out of a relatively small number of individuals, I can't remember the exact number now, I think it was around 20 of individuals that the blood service had identified had received transfusion from someone who went on to develop variant CJD. Seeing three in that small group, statistically, I think, was telling you very clearly that this was transmission. <clears throat> and um, we can see from the SIAC advice that we looked at in 97, 98, that, that was a, uh, there was a view shared at SIAC that, 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 that there may be uh, uh, transmission by blood. Um, was that, that view that, that, that there may be transmission by blood shared widely amongst other colleagues outside SIAC? Is that, was that, to your knowledge? Um, well, there was usually a range of views on SIAC itself. Uh, you know, my recollection, it's only a recollection, is that there was a broad consensus that we, you know, we had to assume blood transfusion associated cases had occurred. And I think it's, um, if you read the paper we wrote in The Lancet, you know, describing the third patient with secondary variant CJD from blood transfusion. I mean, that was published in The Lancet. You know, it's, it's the world's premier <laughs> clinical journal and subject to extremely uh, rigorous peer review. And I think, that, you know, there was a consensus in the medical community that the transmission was occurring, yes. Hmm. Um, can I then ask you, um, again, broadly, um, what happens when, you, when, a per when a person becomes infected with uh, BCJD? Um, is it right to understand that the, um, uh, well, I think you've told us that the, 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 the um, abnormal prions infect the lymphoreticular system before they infect the brain. So it, at that stage, as uh, you've described it working through uh, up into the brain, at that stage before it gets to the brain, it is a does a person exhibit any symptoms? No, they don't. I, I should reiterate that we don't, we don't know that series of events for sure in humans. We, we're, we're assuming that from what we observe, but obviously we can't do experimental studies of that nature in humans. But in, in animal models where you see a lymphoreticular phase, that's the sequence of events. Um, and these diseases are remarkably similar across different mammalian species. Indeed, they can transmit between mammalian species, uh, as you know. 
So those models are likely to be reasonably good. But yes, during that period in which the prawns uh, are propagating, you know, ironically in the in the immune system, um, uh, the patients are completely asymptomatic. We've never been able to find any evidence that they do any damage to the immune system. Uh, and certainly the, the patients are completely asymptomatic at that point and may well be for quite some years before the neurological disease, uh, before new, so-called neuroinvasion occurs where the prions have actually got into the central nervous system. And even then it takes quite some time for the disease to actually develop. And so at that stage where they're asymptomatic, is it understood that the um, person um, is infected? In other words, that their blood or their lymphoreticulous tissue could infect another person? That's the assumption, yes. Um, and indeed, the, the, the patients who've been reported in the literature with secondary variant CJD, you know, they'd received blood from a donor who was asymptomatic at the time of donating blood. Uh, and so <clears throat> the public health concern is that there may be donors out there, blood donors out there, who are infected with VCJD, VCJD and infectious, but, but, does, but don't know it because they're completely asymptomatic. Correct. Um, uh, and we'll come on to look at, uh, at your work um, trying to um, uh, meet that challenge uh, later on this morning. Um, so uh, uh, as the disease progresses and the um, abnormal pri um, pr prion proteins make their way to the central nervous system and to the brain, um, I think you said that it, it can be quite some time before a person starts exhibiting symptoms. Are you able to tell us how long between sort of you would expect symptoms to arise between the sort of invasion of prions to the central nervous system and, and and the person becoming symptomatic and becoming unwell? Um, of course, one, you need to know when the patient was infected. And in many instances, for example, in primary infection with BSE, we don't know which, which, which meal or meals led to the infection. With, with blood transfusion associated variant CJD, uh, we do know because, the, of course, the blood service keeps excellent records and can trace the particular blood donation that will have led to that infection. So even there in secondary variant CJD, where we'd expect the incubation period to be shorter on average than in primary transmissions, for reasons reason I can explain if you want me to. Um, you know, we're looking at incubation periods of six or seven years. Um, what the average is in humans with primary transmission, you know, it, it's, it's probably more than 10 years. Um, so there's a long period in which people are potentially infectious to others but would be completely unaware that they were themselves infected. Uh, and what are the clinical features of, of the CJD and have, have they changed over the years? Um, it's a little different in its initial presentation from classical CJD in that it often has a, uh, a pronounced psychiatric onset. Uh, patients um, experience anxiety, depression, uh, social withdrawal. Uh, which can go on for quite some time. Um, and needless to say, those are conditions that are very common in the general population, so wouldn't necessarily lead clinicians to think this was variant CJD. So that there's a long prodromal period. Um, other features that are quite unusual with respect to classical CJD are um, abnormal sensations, including pain uh, in the legs and around the mouth, which can be quite disturbing. Uh, pain is a very unusual feature of CJD, uh, but uh, individuals with variant CJD often described a lot of discomfort, uh, tingling sensations or, or pain uh, in the legs. Uh, and so that was a, uh, an important feature. Um, they, often, they then go on to develop uh, features which are essentially indistinguishable from the classical forms of CJD. They begin to develop cognitive problems, memory problems, uh, going on to frank dementia, uh, movement disorders, abnormal uh, involuntary movements uh, become very common, uh, particularly myoclonus, involuntary muscular jerks, and some patients with variant CJD develop career, uh, sort of ri involuntary writhing movements. Um, but it eventually progresses in a way that's more characteristic of typical uh, CJD, um, and going through to a, to a point where the patient's uh, uh, become akinetic and mute, 
uh, which is generally the terminal stage of the disease, and, and they're bedbound and unable to, to speak or, or move. Moving then on to the diagnostic process um, that you undertake at the, at the prion unit, um, you told us that you offer inpatient and indeed outpatient assessment uh, of, 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 of all types of suspected prion disease. Um, what are the range of tests that you can perform to um, diagnose somebody to establish whether or not they are indeed suffering from CJD and whether it's VCJD? Um, well, we do a whole range of, of, uh, of blood tests and um, tests on the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, both to exclude other conditions. It's important to exclude any conditions that might be treatable. Uh, but usually, these days, it's, it's relatively straightforward making a firm diagnosis of CJD. Um, and this is because of advances in neuroimaging, in magnetic resonance imaging, the particular types of MRI scans we do that nearly always uh, provide a, a clear diagnosis. Uh, there's also a new test which has been available for several years on cerebrospinal fluid called RT-QUIC. Uh, this is also um, uh, very specific and sensitive for, for CJD and is, is helpful if there's any doubt about the diagnosis. Um, but usually it can be diagnosed in the appropriate clinical context uh, with the brain scan uh, and associated uh, blood tests. We, we sometimes also do electroencephalograms. Um, there are, in classical CJD, there, there are characteristic features you often see on the electroencephalogram. It's not so helpful in variant CJD, usually. Uh, and indeed, the RT-QUIC test I've just mentioned tends not to be very helpful in variant CJD. Uh, in variant CJD, there are specific findings on the MRI scan which can be helpful in making and here we're talking about diagnosing symptomatic patients. Correct. Uh, and we see um, on the documentation uh, the three different terms given for diagnosis of, of VCJD. We see possible, probable, and definite. C can you explain to us the difference between the three and, and why you would come to one or the other? Yeah, th those are terms that were developed for epidemiological surveillance purposes and, and that, that are used internationally so that um, uh, case ascertainment can be compared uh, across populations. Um, the, um, there are a set of criteria by which you would determine whether someone has probable variant CJD. The word probable is in, in terms of its common sense perhaps a little misleading when we talk about probable CJD, the diagnosis is actually almost certain. Um, but uh, it's regarded as being essential to have uh, actual tissue diagnosis at autopsy to be absolutely certain of the diagnosis. So definite uh, implies that a neuropathological examination has been carried out which shows the characteristic pathology of whether it's sporadic CJD or variant CJD. In practice, uh, you know, the diagnosis can usually be made with confidence during life. So a probable diagnosis it is, in fact, a, a diagnosis for... Certainly with CJD, thankfully we don't see very much variant CJD uh, in recent years, but uh, with classical CJD, the, when we call it probable CJD, it's almost certain. Uh, I can't recall the National Prime Clinic when... Um, there, there, was, there was an error there. I think cases classified as probable CJD that when they go on to autopsy uh, have always been confirmed as such. <clears throat> and I'm going to come on to ask you um, about testing asymptomatic patients when we've had, when you've given some evidence about the work that you've done on, on, on the blood test and the DDA um, later on uh, this morning. Um, so I'm going to turn now to um, uh, I'll ask you questions about the care and treatment available for those with VCJD, again, in, in general terms. Um, are there any curative treatments available at the moment? No. <clears throat> um, we have... Um, we carried out a clinical trial at the request of the Department of Health some years ago of a drug called quinacrine, uh, which uh, wasn't effective. Uh, a number of other clinical trials have been carried out around the world which were also didn't show any overall benefit to patients. 
Um, we've recently developed a therapeutic monoclonal antibody. I, I think you have that paper that we recently published in Lancet Neurology, which is showing promising uh, preliminary results that we need to go on to do a formal uh, clinical trial to, to get further evidence in that regard. But at the moment, there's no, there's no available treatment for any of these diseases that stops the progression of the disease. There are, there are lots of symptomatic treatments we can give to try and ameliorate some of the symptoms uh, that occur in the disease. So the reference for the transcript of that paper that you've just um, mentioned of the trial of the uh, um, uh, PRN100, is that what it's called? The yes. Uh, uh, monoclonal antibody is WITN3093004. Um, given that there's no curative treatment, is there an optimum time for, for, for diagnosing somebody with BCJD? Um, well, it's always better to make the diagnosis as early as possible, uh, even though there isn't any treatment. Obviously, I hope we're on the verge of offering treatments that are disease modifying and there it will be absolutely essential to get there as early as possible before irreversible damage to the brain has occurred. But even in the absence of, of a treatment at present that's, that's generally available, um, making the diagnosis early uh, of course avoids doing unnecessary further investigations which is you know, taking up valuable time in that patient's life and their family that they could spend uh, doing other things. Um, the diagnosis early also means uh, if you diagnose it at the point where the, the patient still has mental capacity, of course they can take decisions about how they want their care to proceed, uh, and plan, plan the remainder of their life uh, with their family and hopefully um, get the maximum uh, out of you know, spending the rest of their life with their, with their loved ones. So I think early diagnosis is always beneficial uh, for all those reasons. I'm going to um, now ask you um, uh, some questions uh, before we break this morning about um, access to care, uh, specialist care for those patients who um, have been treated with um, uh, blood that's come from a donor who's subsequently gone on to develop BCJD. I'm talking here about blood components, so red cells and so on, not plasma products. Um, so um, if we can turn to a letter that you wrote to Professor Sally Davis, please, on 6th of December 2004, which is at WITN 3093003. Um, so we can see there um, the date and, and who the... Um, letter is written to, and if we go down to the bottom half of the page, please, at the paragraph beginning, although, um, and you say this, although there are major research opportunities here of crucial importance to public health risk assessment and risk management that I consider to be my duty to bring to the attention of the department, my principal concern was, and remains, ensuring that the small cohort of known recipients of blood from infected donors is properly counselled and offered access to the specialist clinical services of the National Prion Clinic at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. I am concerned that these people may have been counselled, as were recipients of potentially contaminated plasma products, that their risk is very low, when this does not appear to me to be the case, and both diagnostic investigations and access to a therapeutic trial are immediately available. So just pausing there, um, can you uh, uh, recall, you seem to be saying there that, that, that the group of patients who have been exposed to blood components from uh, people that have donors that have gone on to develop BCJD um, may not that their risk of developing BCJ, BCJD may not be low. What was the factual basis for your view at that stage? Um, the risk wasn't low to those that small group of patients. Well, as, a, as I mentioned, there were, there were three people who developed secondary variant CJD from a very small group of patients. I think it was 
of memory 23 or 24 patients. So it seemed to me that the risk to the others was quite significant. Um, and, uh, you know, there was and is a specialist clinic with, with specialist expertise. Obviously, with rare diseases, you know, most clinicians will never have seen uh, that disease. And so ensuring the patients at least knew about the existence of a specialist service that, that could counsel them and, uh, and assist them seemed to me to be important. And here you're drawing a <coughs> distinction in the level of risk between those that have been exposed to uh, donations um, from people that have developed BCJD and, and, and received red cell concentrate blood components, as opposed to those that have been exposed to um, what's often referred to as implicated batches yeah. of plasma products, i.e. a donation from somebody who has gone on to develop VCJD, has gone into the plasma pool that has gone on to um, turn into factor eight, factor nine, etc. other plasma products. And you're drawing a distinction in the level of risk between those two groups of patients, is that right? That's right, on the basis of the evidence at the time. Of course, if you're transfusing somebody from and, and you know, you're, you're transfusing a pint of blood into somebody, it's, it's a lot of material. And if that's come from someone who's incubating variant CJD, it seems to me the risk of infecting them is quite high. Um, uh, uh, yes. And, and so um, the, these, these individuals, it seemed to me, uh, ought to be being counseled appropriately and offered, offered appropriate follow-up. Obviously, it's entirely up to them as individuals what, what they wanted to do. Uh, whether they were happy just speaking to their GP or whether they wanted local neurological referral or specialist neurological referral to us in London, but uh, it, it seemed to me they ought to have the option uh, of that. Uh, and can you recall whether or not you um, saw the letter that was sent to those patients? I, I, I can put it up on the screen if you... Um... Um, I seem to remember there was a large package of material that was sent out to, to GPs. Uh, it was a rather, that's a long time ago, and it's a rather complicated uh, series of events. I'm not sure I can remember exactly what was sent. If, if we, perhaps it's, it's um, helpful to put up um, now the, the, the letter that, was, that, that certainly the patients received. It's SCGV um, 301019. Was that sent at this time? But the letter to Sally Davis was yes. It's, it precedes the letter to Sally Davis. It says for patients exposed to risk of variant VCJD through blood components, Health Protection Agency, December two thousand and three, and it says why are you contacting me? Patients being diagnosed with VCJD, probably caused by blood transfusion. This patient received blood donated by a person who later developed VCJ, VCJD. This is the first time that this has happened. Some other people also donated blood before they became ill with VCJD. You have received blood donated by one of them. And then it says, uh, what is VCJD? I don't need to read that. And then, do I, need to, do I need to know about this? The risk appears to be very small, but it's important that you know, even though this may regrettably cause you anxiety, we must do all we can to protect other patients. And then it goes on to give other information and in particular at the bottom of that page what precautions do I need to take it sets out the public health precautions that the person is being asked to take which is presumably the, the point of this notification but it's that it's that paragraph is it um, do I need to know about this which says that the risk appears to be very small that you see you are taking um, uh, that you are concerned about in your less letter we just saw to uh, to Dame Sally Davis Yes, uh, with, with that subgroup of the patients who were uh, transfused with whole units of blood from an infected donor, yes, it didn't seem to me that it was right to say the risk was very small. Uh, and could we then go back to the, the letter to Sally um, Davis, please, just to pick up on the points that you were just making. It's WITN 3093003. So below that paragraph we just looked at, you make the points you've just made. You indicate that the NBS and NCJDSU are involved. Uh, just, just pause Sorry. for a moment. Yes. We're not down there. We're not down there yet. Back down a bit further, please, Lawrence. 
Um, you yes, indicate, so start again. You indicate that the NBS and the NCGDSU, that's the Edinburgh unit, are involved and are considering further monitoring activities. Such surveillance activities are certainly appropriate, but I am unclear who is actually taking clinical responsibility for the management of their potential iatrogenic prion infection. My colleagues and I have no, me have no means of identifying such individuals or a re remit to do so. Um, and we have not, as yet, received any such referrals. And then we go over the page. BCJD is a man-made and invariably lethal neurodegenerative condition. Its secondary transmission by iatrogenic route is tragic. It is, however, like all prion diseases, associated with a prolonged clini clinically silent incubation period, when th therapeutic intervention prior to neuroinvasion may have the best chance of success. I see this as an urgent clinical matter. More than two months have elapsed since my urgent email to CMO. We must do better than this for this group of individuals, potentially infected, albeit accidentally, by the NHS in the course of other medical treatment. The NHS has specialist clinical services to manage such patients, and my colleagues and I must express our deep concern that we are not able to do so. Uh, and so here, you're, you're saying a number of things, aren't you? But primarily you're saying we, as the specialist unit, don't know who these patients are, so we cannot get hold of them to tell them that we're here and that we might be able to help them. Yes, yeah, so and they're not being told we, we're here, yeah. And we did have a clinical trial going on at the time of a potential therapeutic. <clears throat> uh, and then if we can um, turn then to, to, to a further letter that you wrote in January 2006, uh, and that's DHSC 304223 underscore 065. And this is a letter, 23rd of January 2006, so we're just over a year later, uh, to Professor Sir Liam Donaldson, the, ch the Chief Medical Officer at the time. And you refer in the first paragraph um, to the uh, uh, a letter you, you written in September 2004, um, September 2004 uh, about the concerns um, uh, about the management of the um, patients um, that you wrote and, and the letter you wrote to Sally Davis which we've just looked at um, and then you go on in the second paragraph there um, uh, you, you say there that you, that, that you are concerned that this co cohort of of patients iatrogenically exposed to BCG D, D, D prions during NHS treatment and whom, in my expert opinion, are at high risk of being infected with this lethal pathogen, um, have still not been ac offered access to best practice care in the NHS. So your view has changed, uh, has, has moved on a little bit from, from the previous letter we looked at where you were saying, well, it, it may not be low risk. Here you're actually saying, actually, it's high risk now. Um, in your view, by January 2006. Uh, and then you go on to set out in that paragraph at, at the bottom there the lengthy discussions that you've had with the Health Protection Agency um, in order to try and um, establish a way that you would be able to communicate directly with the GPs of the patients of this small group of, uh, 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 of, this small group of patients. Um, and um, uh, you, your concern about delay and then if we go over the page, you say this, it's my strong clinical opinion that these individuals should be offered NPC review and long-term follow-up immediately whilst they are asymptomatic. This will enable those electing diagnostic, um, th 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 this will enable those electing diagnostic lymphoreticular biopsy that test positive to enter the prion one trial with the option of joining the immediate treatment arm. While we do not know if quinacrine could reduce the probability of progression to clinical disease, clearly the earliest possible intervention would give any drug the best opportunity. As you know, MP staff can visit those unwilling or unable to travel to London. And personally, as an NHS physician, as well as in my academic position with the national leadership responsibility in this area, I am deeply concerned at the way that this matter has been handled. I believe that good clinical practice requires that these patients are provided with clear information in order to make informed choices regarding their predicament at the very earliest opportunity. 
This is best achieved by the specialist staff of the NPC contacting patients, GPs personally in order to brief them fully. Um, and, and then you um, say right at the bottom of that letter, clearly HPA and NCG, NCJDSU have an important role in surveillance of this cohort and the public health issues arising and their proposed information package could then follow. But I hope you will agree that this should not risk confusing or further delaying direct contact with specialist NHS services. Um, so, um, I, I can, uh, if I can just show you one more letter before we break uh, and then ask you a, a couple of questions, um, and that is um, DHSC 0004223 underscore 066. And this is, um, you'll recall the letter we're looking, we've just looked at is 23rd of January and then we have a letter here 26th of January, so three days later again to Professor Celian Donaldson. And you say this, further to my letter of 23rd January regarding my urgent concerns on this matter, I'm writing to inform you that I have subsequently seen one of this group of patients recently referred by his GP to my colleague Stephen Rowe at the National Prime Clinic. We've made a clinical diagnosis of VCJD and a tonsil biopsy is pending. This gentleman, who has been symptomatic for some considerable time, could have been referred to us more than a year ago, thus avoiding inappropriate treatment and giving him the option to enter the MRC Prion 1 therapy trial, which he has now chosen to do. Understanding, understandably, in my opinion, the family have expressed some anger at the way that this matter has been handled. This case illustrates precisely the concerns that I have raised repeatedly with the department for over a year. The identification of this third transfusion-associated case from a small cohort further strengthens my assessment that the other remaining known exposed individuals are at high risk. And then you ask for an urgent response to your request so that you're given the opportunity to contact the GPs of the remaining individuals to offer rapid assessment of their patients at the NPC. So uh, having looked at those um, letters uh, and having um, pointed out to the Department of Health that precisely the, uh, what you feared would happen had in fact happened, there'd been late diagnosis for, for, for at least one of these patients, what, what was the response? Um, I think there was, from memory, a, a reply from David Harper, which I think you may have. Yes. Um, who we do, was we a very senior official um, who replied on behalf of Liam Donaldson. Yes, we can, we can look at that. It's DHSC 304223 underscore 067. Um, and in the first paragraph at the bottom there, he says, I'm replying to your joint letter on behalf of Sir Liam Donaldson to the previous letters of 23rd and 26th of January. And then if we go over the page, we can see his response on the second paragraph down on the question of whether it's in the best interest of at-risk cohort individuals for the GP contact details to be provided to the NPC. The department's view is that the patient's interests and the right to make an informed choice must be uppermost in our minds. They have been informed of the risk of the, to themselves and asked to take steps to protect others. That's the information we saw. The GPs have been encouraged to refer their patients for specialist care and provided with details on how to do this. The GP is responsible for the overall clinical care of the person and is best placed to act as their impartial advisor. The information pack sent from HPA on the 6th of February makes the options for referral very clear and the processes to be followed should, be individual opt, should the individual opt for that choice. So that, that's the response. Did, did that address your concern, first of all, that information had been given that the risk was low rather than high? No, I don't think it, it answered that. I think they did, I can't remember the exact sequence of events here, but I think they did eventually send out a package of, of material to GPs, uh, which included our contact details. I don't know whether that was done at this time or, or subsequently. Um, I mean, I would agree that the GP is the person responsible for the overall clinical care. I think what we were seeking to do is ensure the you know, we could support the GPs with what is, of course, a very specialised situation uh, with an extremely rare condition they will never have seen before, um, and you know, making aware, them aware of the specialist services we can offer, 
and, and in the context of us doing a clinical therapeutic trial, as I mentioned, unfortunately it didn't work, but we didn't know that at the time. Uh, we were offering a, a potential therapy uh, to patients in a trial which, which we've been asked to do by Sir Liam Donaldson. So um, it, it did seem to me a little illogical that we weren't um, you know, making sure that everyone was in the picture about what the options were. Obviously, ultimately, it's for the patients and their families to decide. But I was concerned that they may have the view that the risk was very low, you know, some sort of theoretical risk, uh, and um, that they ought to they have access to, to specialist care should they wish it. And the hmm. fact is, somebody who was eventually diagnosed with VCJ, VCJD wasn't referred to you for, was it over a year after receiving the initial notification? Correct. And, and from memory, as I, as I mentioned, they've been treated for, I think, for depression for some time. So I note the time. I wonder if now is a, a good time to take a break. Yeah, yes, I wonder if I may just just uh, ask this for, for clarification. Your, your complaint, um, if I can call it that, uh, about what was being done was essentially this, was it? That uh, you had been set up as a national prion clinic, but when GPs were uh, contacted, the information didn't say, look, we have set up a, a super regional national, in fact, clinic to deal with this because of the need for specialism, um, but instead were partly expected or may have referred to local neurologists who might know nothing very much about the subject, certainly not as much as you did. So the problem is really a problem of communication, is it, as to the options for the GP to discuss with the patient? I think that's right. I, you know, I think the best, the optimum care for the patient was to have access to the GP, to, to local neurologists and to specialist neurologists all working together uh, with good communication. I mean, a crude way of putting it is there's no point having a national clinic uh, to act as a specialist clinic for the nation without telling people enough about it. Precisely so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll take a break uh, now. We'll, we'll take a break until 10 to 12. Now, during the, the break, Professor, uh, I'll say to you what I say to all witnesses at this stage, if I haven't already said it. You're giving evidence. Uh, you may not discuss the evidence you have given or any evidence you think you may yet be asked to give with anyone, whoever that person is, but you can talk about anything else you like. 10 to 12.